We have a very exciting um, panel here about nuclear in the 21st century. My name is William Murray. I'm the Federal Energy Policy Manager for R Street. We're a pragmatic think tank. Our cards say free markets, real solutions. And uh, one of the things that we talked about for a long time with energy is nuclear power. And in particular, right now, we're talking about the advantages of microgrids, or excuse me, micro, micro reactors. Microgrids are great too, but micro reactors that are 10 megawatts or smaller. And so what that means is that we need a new regulatory regime that allows for a lot of more innovation and doing all sorts of things, and there's lots of science out there. And so the point is, we have written a paper that was published today uh, by Breakthrough, and I just want to introduce the uh, panelists to her for, uh, for the rest of the hour. Uh, Jessica Lovering is the primary author of the paper that we just published. And she is the head of uh, director of energy for Breakthrough. We have uh, Katie Tubb, who is a policy analyst with Heritage, and who does a lot of work on energy and regulation. We have Matt McKenzie, who is a senior scientist at the National, at, excuse me, the Natural Resources Defense yes. Fund, and Council. also Council, excuse me. And uh, Spencer Nelson, who is with Clear Path Foundation. He does a lot of nuclear um, things. So let's uh, hold these up and start talking. Uh, the um, the big question I have, Jessica, if you could just you know, give a quick summary, if you can, of uh, the report, the white paper, and some of the findings that were made, and then we can continue on and talk about uh, aspects of it. Yeah, thank you. So um, Breakthrough and uh, several other think tanks in D.C., we've been talking about advanced nuclear innovation for a while, kind of figuring out how to commercialize it, how um, to accelerate that commercialization. And something that we kept hearing from folks was that, you know, lots of exciting R&D is happening, there's all these companies, but to really get one of these plants built, the first one, it's going to be a big investment from government. A big, we're going to need to sort of reinstate these programs we had in the 60s, um, kind of top-down, big investment. And how are we going to make that happen? How are we going to get the political will um, together to kind of push that through? And we didn't really see that actually being feasible in, in the current government situation, really um, just not this administration, but sort of any administration in the last 20 years or probably in the next 20 years. So um, we wanted to bring people together uh, from, from different sides of the political spectrum to talk about new policy options, and particularly people who were interested in nuclear but were pretty skeptical of any kind of big government investment. Um, and we got people together to brainstorm some ideas, um, really thinking outside of the box on how to get these advanced designs moving forward. Uh, and what we really coalesced around, as Bill has hinted at, was this idea of going really small, um, at least really small to start, uh, maybe scaling up later. But by focusing on um, commercializ commercializing micro-reactors, um, as we outlined in the report, um, it sort of relieves a lot of the challenges to commercializing something really new in nuclear. Uh, it's much easier to invest in. You can actually have a single investor that's able to fund the capital for these projects. Uh, you don't need to have a you know cost share with the government. Um, and it's also the risk is so much lower. Um, it's pretty you know trivial, and, and it can help to fast track a lot of the regulation or streamline some of the regulation if you're just designing regulation for these really tiny designs. You don't have to think of what's the worst case scenario for a one gigawatt plant, um, because the worst case scenario for something this small, something two megawatts, is um, really not going to be a, a public health concern or a public safety concern. So um, it started getting us um, really excited about the opportunities here, because there's a lot that you can do differently, um, and there's a lot that you would need to do differently in terms of policies to actually get this new um, innovation system moving around micro -reactors. So um, for us, one of the most exciting things about the technology is that by focusing on manufactured microreactors, you can actually start getting learning by doing in manufacturing. You can start driving down that learning curve um, like you do with cars or aircraft or um, gas turbines where you're actually now sort of selling a product that people can purchase ahead of time and they know when it's coming and they know how much it's going to cost. Um, and that's really exciting, but it's also, um, you definitely need different policies. And so what we worked through in the white paper is some of the policies that could make that happen. And just to outline a few of them, um, really looking at the role of the government as sort of a 
enable or building out this support infrastructure for this innovation rather than being kind of the prime investor, the prime mover of these new technologies. And we think that's a, a much better role for government with these technologies and actually it's kind of what both sides want. Um, and lastly, I'll say the other kind of exciting thing about micronuclear is that um, it also opens up new markets for off-grid applications, whether it's um, communities that are connected to the grid or industrial sites, um, and also taps into this growing demand for distributed clean energy. So whether it's um, small cities or municipalities that want to own their own power generation, or it's um, regions that want to be able to balance their grid with growing penetration of renewables. Um, smaller nuclear can help them do that. Uh, and it's much more attractive to a lot of different markets and a lot of different customers. So, uh, yeah. Could you actually just tell, tell us what the recommendations were? Yes. <laughs> so one of the big ones is um, coming up with um, regulations within new regulations within NRC to um, streamline licensing for these really small designs. There's a couple of ideas kind of already going through NRC that might work, um, and if not, looking at um, kind of making a, like a skunk works within NRC that can develop uh, really risk-informed regulation for these small designs. Uh, the other one is um, allowing uh, federal sites to do much longer power purchase agreements with micro-reactors. Um, they already can do power purchase agreements, but only for 10 years. Um, so extending that to 40 years. We also talk a little bit about maybe um, kind of allowing them to do above market rate PPAs to kind of uh, incentivize the national security benefits of micronuclear or the grid reliability benefits. Um, one of the big ones uh, that a lot of these advanced nuclear companies have really express that they need is um, access to a fast reactor testing facility so they can test new fuels, um, new materials, um, different different aspects of their reactor. Right now, most companies have to go to Russia, which is unattractive for several reasons. So um, having that capability in the US would make a really big difference to these private companies that are trying to develop new products. Um, the fourth one is something um, we've identified mostly as an opportunity. We're not um, entirely sure on what the solution is, but Price Anderson is up um, for renewal in 2025. And so thinking about with these really small designs, um, do we really need that same um, <coughs> cap on liability and sort of uh, government um, back on, on insurance for, for catastrophic accidents? Uh, and is there a way, because the, the risk is so small, um, is there a better way that we can do it? Maybe private insurance can handle it, uh, or maybe some, some exception or something different for these micro-reactors. Uh, and the last one is um, coming up with a source for high assay, low enriched uranium. So that's uranium, uranium fuel that's enriched up to 20%. Um, a lot of these advanced reactors rely on these um, fuels, which we currently don't have a source for in the US. Uh, so that would be a, a big bottleneck in the supply chain for a lot of these companies. And the U.S. has some stockpiles of higher enriched uranium. Uh, I won't say lying around. Uh, very secure. But um, oh, yeah. I say low enriched uranium. And HEU. And HEU, that they want to downblend mm -hmm. for security reasons. Um, and you could downblend it to LEU, but mm -hmm. maybe we could set aside some to, to keep as, as high assay um, so that we'd have a reserve to kind of um, get these first – First sets of reactors going. Um, so, well, those are the recommendations. Yeah. So, Katie, have you read the report? What do you think? Uh, I definitely think there's some good things in there. Um, <laughs> things like. You can be honest. I would say things like power <laughs> purchase agreements, you know, there's a discussion there. Uh, <laughs> not ever in favor of a mandatory PPA, regardless of the uh, technology involved. Um, but I, I think it does open up an interesting conversation. Um, I love the idea of exploring different regulatory regimes using um, Section 104. Uh, that's something I think is definitely worth exploring. Uh, so I, I'd say a mixed bag from the libertarian free market perspective, but I think that's one of the interesting things about this whole um, advanced nuclear conversation is it's really opened up uh, the imagination on regulatory regimes possible 
and the politics of nuclear. Um, I mean, the people on this panel are a great example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Matt, you have some critiques as well? Uh, sure. Can I speaking? press the button? No. I'm just speaking. Just, uh, so, so I'm Matthew McKenzie. Um, so I'm a nuclear physicist by training. Uh, I have a PhD in nuclear physics. I study nu the, nu the nucleus, the structure, and reactions. Um, I work at the NRDC. We're an environmental organization. As a graduate student, as a scientist, I was fascinated by the structure of the nucleus. Um, as an environmentalist, I'm conscious of the really difficult engineering and material science problems um, and societal problems that, that nuclear energy um, presents. I think, you know, overarchingly, one um, commonality, I, I think, uh, in our approach to the, to the report is, is the, um, the sense that, that new energy R&D is required to deal with the threat of climate change, right? But then um, the question that lingers for me as an environmentalist is what role nuclear energy? And then for this report, what role microreactors will play? Um, the, the five recommendations in the report, I have, I have um, you know, as a, uh, an invited guest, thank you for inviting me today. You know, I, ha I may have a, a uh, contrasting uh, perspective, and I don't know if we'll consider these five Recommendations one uh, one by one. Well, you could go into them. <coughs> you could go into a couple right now. And maybe sure. Uh, so the five recommendations, in terms of um, uh, uh, my overall thoughts on them, are that for microreactors for advanced nuclear to succeed, it should succeed on the brilliance of the engineering, the robustness of the design. It should not rely on softening regulatory requirements or softening radiation protection standards. It, sh it should s survive because it's a very strong business product. Um, and so uh, I have concerns in the report where, um, where some of the regulatory and environmental um, standards are, are called into question uh, you know, with respect to the, to, to the business model. The report also talks about the fast, plus, fast flux test reactor which is a proposed DOE project. Um, uh, the uh, Energy Department under Secretary Muniz uh, had a, a study of this concept. And, and really, there were three questions to ask about the past flux test reactor. Um, can you do that kind of research if you refurbish or um, increase US capabilities? Is that a cheaper option? Can you do these experiments abroad? Uh, you mentioned Russia, but there, there, are, other, there are other options. Um, and, and critically, can you build this test, this experimental facility, and build a demonstration reactor? You may not have money, probably don't have money for both. What's more important for the reactor community? To build a facility to test materials under flux of fast neutrons, or, or to actually build a prototype of one of the advanced nuclear designs? So those are, you know, those are some questions to ask, and, and Secretary Moniz's advisory board, you know, examined these questions and published a report in February of 2017. Um, uh, finally, uh, uh, I'd just like to say that um, uh, NRDC, we're, we're an environment where, you know, climate change is, is our mission, de dealing with climate change. Um, we, uh, nevertheless, ideologically, we're not an anti-nuclear organization. We, we, you know, I, I, I follow the technology closely to understand what possibilities are out there. Um, uh, nevertheless, this is a very challenging time for nuclear energy, in the United States particularly, in terms of what happens with the aging plants and troubles with, with new plant construction. So uh, I'd say the future is, is uncertain, but important to consider. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and I think this report is, uh, is uh, important to read in yeah. that perspective. Well, that's why we wrote it, was to get the ball rolling in terms of people talking about what needs to happen for, uh, for the industry. So Spencer, what do you uh, what do you think of the report and some of the critiques so far? Yeah, um, I like the report a lot. Um, ClearPath really cares about nuclear because it's zero emission, it's um, it's highly reliable, uh, but also it's really important from a geopolitical perspective. I saw some report. I think it was I think it was the Economist last week that was pulling some World Nuclear Association data, and seventy five percent of all of the nuclear reactors that are under construction or planned around the world right now are either of Chinese or Russian origin, um, and these are really long relationships, right? I mean, you, some of you all have already heard this, but 
you know, it's a hundred year relationship once you build a nuclear reactor. Um, and there's some concerns that the Russians and Chinese, if they build these um, reactors in other countries, that they could potentially use those relationships for geopolitical advantage or use them as leverage. And historically, the US has been a leader in that. I, I believe Westinghouse supplies the fuel for about half of all the reactors that are currently in the world. Um, and that's, that's really helpful from a free market, uh, free market, uh, small L liberal world. Um, so we would love to have America continue to be a leader in nuclear. Um, both in the U.S. and also globally from, for climate reasons and for geopolitical reasons. Um, and the reason I like this report is that micronuclear, when you look at some of those regulatory reforms, um, it can show um, really some big opportunities because they're really small, they're really safe, and those margins are very different compared to some of the larger light water reactors. Um, so you're able to look at things in a different light. So a um, couple of things that we're most interested in uh, that are recommended in the report are some of the changes around 104, uh, which is a section of the Atomic Energy Act that allows uh, lower regulatory standards, of course, still um, safe. And uh, additionally, looking at risk-informing sections of um, the NRC code outside of the actual um, reactor licensing. So looking at what is the actual risk of, um, of security issues, of environmental issues, rather than setting a deterministic basis. Um, also, the, uh, the high assay, low enriched uranium piece is extraordinarily important just because that fuel um, issue has created kind of a chicken and the egg problem. If there's no fuel available, you can't build the advanced reactors. If there are no advanced reactors, a lot of the fuel suppliers aren't interested in building those facilities. Um, so I'm happy to look at some of this stuff and ClearPath does a, a large number of different policy initiatives and we also have uh, some cousin organizations that do some lobbying as well, so we'd like to move some of these forward too. Before we go any further, which one of you wants to explain how the generations work for nuclear reactors? These are mostly four, generation four, correct? Right? Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll do a really simple job, but um, I, and I will skip generation one because it's not fair to me. Generation <laughs> two is, is, is most of everything that we've built in the U.S. Um, and around the world. Uh, particularly in the U.S., it's everything we built in you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and it's you know, light water reactors and, and non-light water reactors, but um, those things we built before. Generation three, and really what we're building today, generation three plus, is um, a new fleet of, I would say, advanced light water reactors. So these big, um, newer light water reactors like the AP1000, like the EPR in Europe, um, that have a lot of cool um, safety features. They have some passive safety um, they have some modular <coughs> construction techniques. Um, they have better performance, better efficiency, uh, but they're still light water reactors. They're still pretty similar to the generation two. Um, and we're just, I think the first one just came online this year um, was the AP1000 in China. Oh, the EPR just in came online too. Yeah, yeah. In, both in China. So um, those are just coming online. Um, you know, there's going to be a market for them, but uh, generation four is a lot of the what we're talking about when we say advanced nuclear. So that's things like um, high temperature gas reactors, molten salt reactors, uh, things that use um, very different coolants, very different fuels. Um, they all have um, much different safety. They have very intrinsic passive safety, uh, so very um, hard for them to have any sort of catastrophic accident where there's an off-site release of uh, radioactive material. Um, but it can mean a lot of different things. And when we talk about SMRs, um, often that's small light water reactors. So um, those are often Gen 3 um, designs. But we, you know, sometimes advanced includes SMRs of, of any any stripe. So lots of different technologies. Yeah, sure. Uh, and uh, a characteristic of, of Generation 2 is that um, uh, uh, for safety uh, in the event of a severe accident to prevent that accident from happen happening for generation two you need to have equipment in place and personnel who can operate that equipment um, and that really sort of um, limits the um, uh, the lowest that you can get risk and so generation three and four aspire not to require humans using equipment that's available in the event of a severe accident so the safety issue for you, I mean, it makes sense that these new designs, uh, even though they haven't been 
tested yet anywhere in the field, uh, statistically, they would, they would be a lot um, well, the, uh, for Generation uh, 4 designs, I'd say the, the key is to get hard data from a prototype um, in order to understand its safety, its reliability, and, and its economics. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about... Can I add one more thing on that? Sure. Um, oh, sorry. I, I do want to note that the existing nuclear reactors are very safe and are highly safe and are highly regulated and highly safe. Um, the Gen 4, um, I think, have a lot of additional attributes that make them really attractive outside of um, just the fact that they have an increased safety margin, which is an added benefit. Um, they're often a lot more flexible, can do more load following, they can provide additional services, operate at higher temperatures, um, things that we're going to need if we were going to switch to a, um, a more diverse energy economy. So I like to think of them more as, you know, they can play, they can play different spots on a, on a team, right? They're not all they're not all forwards. They're not all just producing electricity. They can do different things, which is yeah. great. And I would say just to add on to that, one thing that's I is really cool about passive safety is that it it results in technology that's um, cheaper because it's safer, uh, which is sort of counterintuitive. You'd think you know to make something cheaper, you might have to you know push the boundaries on safety, but it's actually not true. It's actually you can get much safer reactors that are much cheaper because. You don't have all these redundant systems and active controls. You rely much more on physics for your safety rather than engineering. And so um, that's kind of a, you know, reactors today are very safe. Mm -hmm. um, so why do we need to make them safer? Well, you can actually make them much sure, cheaper yeah. in the process. Yeah, good point. So let's talk a bit about the business plan because right now nuclear is suffering from just real competition, whether it's wind subsidies or just natural gas itself. So what is the business, what is the business argument what is the business, what is the niche that, that these can start to fill? Um, Microreactors or advanced reactors? Microreactors. Um, well, so I went up to um, Alaska recently, um, and if you have to import diesel on a, on a weekly basis and feed that into diesel generators, the, your cost of electricity is just astronomical. Um, and for a lot of folks, especially, I don't remember, I think it was about like 50% of uh, people who live in, in rural Alaska are paying up, you know, upwards of 25% of their all of their expenses on electricity bills. That's really very, very expensive. So I think one of the first places that we would see microreactors deployed are in remote or off-grid places where just the cost of electricity is really high because they're relying on diesel. And instead you could have a microreactor that doesn't, um, hopefully requires a lot less staffing than existing nuclear, of course, um, but also doesn't need to be refueled that often. You could refuel it once every decade, um, which is a lot better than once a week. Um, and it could also have um, really useful military applications, too, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, uh, yes, the, um, I think uh, probably the lowest hanging fruit would be um, uh, these very specialized uh, uh, situations. Uh, I've heard uh, remote mining colonies as one as one example, um, and uh, uh, I think that um, uh, ultimately, you know, when, when these microreactors are costed out, then it'll, the business model might may become clearer. Yeah. And I want to jump in, because um, Breakthrough Institute is very focused also on um, energy poverty and the, you know, one billion people in the world that don't have access to modern um, energy and electricity, and um, while Probably the first market is for microreactors is going to be in the U.S. or Canada. Um, some of these off-grid locations that are willing to pay for it and really you know, think it's a safe place to build. Mm -hmm. I do think there could be a huge potential market in emerging economies where, particularly as we've seen historically, um, the first places that get electricity tend to be industrial consumers. Um, and so in a lot of these countries, say in um, sub-Saharan Africa where we've looked, um, they have large industrial customers. They have big mines. Um, they have extractive industries, and so um, a micro reactor could be uh, really attractive to these places, which are paying a lot of money for their diesel generators right now. Um, and so you could bring in that as sort of the the first um, test case, uh, maybe operated by um, an international body or um, a multinational, and then start selling the excess electricity to the surrounding residents, and that's kind of a good model to um, kind of start expanding electricity out, um, first using for productive uses, someone who's willing to pay, and then moving on. I think I'd add just with all this, that yes, there's so many exciting opportunities with advanced nuclear, micro nuclear, um, but 
we have to, I think one reason this conversation is so important is we don't want to price ourselves out by regulation, which is kind of what we've done with the existing fleet. Um, when you've got Vogel that's costing, you know, 28 billion, that's not a cheap natural gas problem. <laughs> that is a problem with our nuclear innovation abilities and our regulatory structure. Um, so I think that's why this conversation is important because if we're going to take advantage of all of the opportunities that you know advanced nuclear may or may not have, um, we have to have a regulatory structure that makes sense. And then I would argue we also need to let it compete in the market. Um, if we are subsidizing something to death, that's not a competitive industry for the future. Um, so I think the possibilities are endless well, if we want them to be. <laughs> so I guess my question then, I mean, I, sometimes I ask the political little question at the end, but I feel like it's creeping into the center of the conversation. Do we have the political will in Congress right now to uh, make some of these changes that are necessary to uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? I mean, we have seen some movement. Um, yes or no? Um, we have some amount of political, it depends on, I mean, that gets really specific, it depends on what it is. Um, I think that the, you know, the current group of commissioners, are, they're really interested in trying to right size regulations as they are, and they could do a lot on their own right now. Um, not everything requires a change of the Atomic Energy Act, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think we saw that there was a bill passed through the House of Representatives this week that made some minor changes to the Atomic Energy Act. Um, it put some caps on fees. It, it put out some time, some deadlines for different uh, licensing activities. Um, so there is a there is a decent amount of political will. I think it just kind of depends on on the specifics of what we're talking about. But also, the president's probably going to sign the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act into law either tomorrow or, or next week. So there's there's growing political support generally for advancing. Tell us about that act. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so that bill has been uh, kicking around Congress for a couple of years now, um, but it authorizes the versatile test reactor that is included in this report. It sets up an advanced modeling and simulation program at DOE, authorizes that. It also authorizes privately funded reactors to be placed at um, DOE-owned sites uh, for demonstration purposes, which is a really huge deal. Um, and finally, it includes a, uh, a small, um, cost share grant program to defray the cost of NRC licensing. So I, it's a it's a great bill. What will the cost be for a fast test reactor or, or the first example of a prototype? Do we have any idea? Uh, the authorization level that is currently included in um, a number of the bills is uh, somewhere between two and three billion. And that would be for, what is it, is that 400? 40, 400 megawatt smaller, do you know, Mark? I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so they, they haven't gotten to the cost again. Yeah. So it's not a small amount of money. And then no. it runs into the issue of political <coughs> will and, and mm -hmm. being authorized is not being appropriate. Mm -hmm. this time time. Um, one of the things that I was interested in when we talked about it, Price Anderson. Price Anderson is the is the indemnity for the nuclear industry uh, started back in the, in the 50s. And it was re-upped in 2005. And years and it'll be it'll be it'll have to be re-upped again so what is it too soon to talk about uh, price price anderson or is it really important for us to get ahead and try and really have this whole new um, environment that uh, we can adjust in as our street we got our start in insurance so we're very interested in this kind of argument and maybe that could be something that we can work on what do you, what do you, I would say definitely not too soon, not considering too soon. <laughs> considering the pace move? of DC. Yeah, um, and I think it's an interesting conversation around um, micro and advanced nuclear because because of the safety benefits, um, that could significantly drive the price of nuclear down. If you can say, look, we're willing to do 100% um, private insurance, um, forgo Price Anderson if you give us a different regulatory structure, because then the risk is entirely based or born by the operator. And so you're inherently going to have an incentive to be a very safe plant. Um, so definitely not too soon. And I think there's some exciting alternatives to Price Anderson when it comes to these new reactors. Okay, I will push back on that a little bit. I would like to be in a world where the risk is actually well represented and is uh, represented for what the actual radiological risk is. 
but if we don't have an, a change in um, the actual thresholds on, um, on radiation, on exposure, on radiological risk, before we change that, um, I don't know that we're necessarily gonna get to the cost that we want to have. So I would only wanna look at you know, trying to change Price Anderson and those, those liability caps. Um, if we had a commensurate analysis of radiological risk and said, what is the actual risk of exposure to these reactors and let's modify regulations to, to actually reflect that. I wholeheartedly I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, just a few words on Price Anderson. Um, so Price Anderson, as many of you probably know, has two tiers for insurance. The second tier um, relies on um, on public uh, 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 some public support and goes up to ten billion dollars in, in liability. Price Anderson's been actually used once um, by the country in the 1979 Three Mile Island accident, and the total payout for TMI into the 1990s was about seventy million dollars. And if you remember, TMI was an accident where containment held the containment structure. Uh, held and the only venting of radiation were noble gases, right? Um, uh, so, uh, so there we had a seventy million dollar payment under Price Anderson for uh, an accident where containment held. I Fukushima, of course, containment didn't hold, and and that cost is 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 thirty billion. So I would just be very. I read the section on Price Anderson. I would just be very cautious about tinkering with that um, too much. And then um, the report also hints, and you did too, hints at um, the. The basic um, uh, risk associated with exposure to radiation l l at low doses, um, and I would just like to offer the perspective from you know from myself and from NRDC as a scientist that right now the scientific consensus is that risk decreases linearly with dose down to zero without a threshold. That's the basis of the regulatory regime. Like like all science, there is continuous research. Most of the data supporting that is from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing uh, survivors. Uh, so, you know, so that, you know, I would say be cautious about, about taking with Price Anderson. There'll still be 100 generation two reactors on the order of 100 react generation two reactors operating in 2025. And, um, and you know, just look, look at, at the scientific consensus on low dose radiation and, and how risk is evaluated. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think we can all agree probably now is a good time to maybe restart some of these conversations. And in the report, we um, point out maybe restarting DOE's low dose radiation research program, sort of putting more effort back into um, restarting those scientific programs to have a better, um, better understanding for the conversations we might be having in five years around risk informed um, policy and around removing by standards. And it was just reauthorized in HR 589, which it has to be science-based, of course. What about the, uh, you, were, you were just explaining at the beginning about some of the risks and really not really wanting to sacrifice uh, speed and, and ease with regulation. But you know, there is a problem with this fee structure, which is now 90-10, and, and there's the thought of perhaps category, categorical exclusions in NEPA because these, these, uh, these uh, reactors are so small. Um, are you unhappy or, or wary with the idea of kind of lifting the hood on regulations and allowing for a whole new set of, of dynamic uh, science to be experimented with? Um, well, I, th I think it's important to look at what, what constitutes a categorical exclusion to NEPA now. I mean, if you look at what, in, what NASA uh, list says categorical exclusion to NEPA. It's like administrative things, organizational things, and research involving very small quantities of, of radioactive material. So, on the face of it, you know, I, I don't see a microreactor as qualifying for a categorical exclusion on, under NEPA. Um, so that's that's my perspective. Um, I guess I would, I, but I would also look at like. DOE's list of categor cor categorical exclusions, which do include various sizes of um, facilities. Um, I don't remember the exact acreage for a solar farm, but they do have those. And uh, if you think about right now, we have a you know extraordinarily large project down in Georgia at Vogel. It's modifying a, a large chunk of land. It's going to be taking in a lot of water. It's going to have definitely an environmental impact. 
Um, but if you're switching to a microreactor that's the size of you know the qu quarter of an acre, and it's if it's not water cooled, so it doesn't have any direct water intake, um, and it's produced in a factory um, rather than stick built on site, it's going to be a lot smaller. And you're still going to have an environmental assessment that's conducted, even if it's not an environmental impact statement, um, with all that's involved there. So I mean, it's it's just like I guess it's a matter of scale, and maybe you could have some type of sliding scale that's um, rather than a, a straight out um, categorical exclusion, maybe you could have some kind of generic environmental impact statement or something. Just trying to find ways to you know recognize that um, the the full impact is going to be a lot smaller than one of these larger. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things we talked about in the uh, we wrote about in the white paper, we just touched on a bit, but a great piece, a great paper by, by Brick who uh, uh, previously had to do with some of the different models of, of looking at how we would start this new technology or this allow this new technology to grow. One of the best models was the commercialization of NASA in the last ten or twelve years. I was very interested about some of the opt outs, some of the some of the indemnities that basically one of the reasons that, that space SpaceX and some of these others are having such a success is that um, they don't have to worry about insurance for a period of time. Tell us about, more about that. Yeah, so we're talking about commercialization of space launch. Um, particularly cargo launch, um, and there's a, a lot of different things NASA did in trying to particularly stimulate a commercial spaceflight industry, which did not exist um, 20 years ago when they started, um, and is now very vibrant. And one of the things that they did was um, uh, put a, a hold on liability for, particularly for um, crude uh, launches, so launches with people in them, uh, because it was... <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just trying not to say manned. Um, so, um, staffed launches? I don't know. Um, because recognizing, and, and you see this in the text of, uh, in the language um, of the rule, is that um, it's, a, it's an experimental industry, and people are um, you know, doing this at defined safe spaces, these spaceports um, that the country has, and people are agreeing to the risks that are there. And so um, allowing them to take on some of that risk as a private industry uh, and kind of get a, a buffer um, until they start being regulated more rigorously while they're in this experimental phase and kind of giving them a little more flexibility. Um, and you know, there have been deaths in commercial space launch. Uh, there's been a few, um, but there's also been significant um, progress and the people involved um, you know, accepted those liabilities, so. Just to interject, there's pizza in the back. And some of you have not availed yourself. <laughs> but, uh, so please do before you leave. Also, there'll be time for questions. I don't know if there are any questions now. We wanna break this up a bit. Uh, seem like a very engaged audience, so if you wanna think about it, uh, I'll, I'll continue on and we'll talk a bit, oh. bit about other things. So let's hear it. Please Andy stand up Patterson. and introduce yourself. Yeah, Andy Patterson, the very brief council and I'm a fan of the report. But in terms of investment models, we don't we don't have a free market in nuclear. We don't have a free market in electricity. I mean, the stuff is moving so when you look at the landscape across the different states. We're not ever going to have that. Are we still a nuclear? So just to happen, um, none of the major nuclear um, energy powers have free markets for their electricity sector. Um, ours is probably much freer than most of those other countries that have, um, you know, a lot of nuclear power. Sure. But I, I will say, with um, that was one of the other great things that NASA did was they served as a customer for the first uh, commercial space launches, and that's something um, we could be very helpful for for these first um, advanced reactors, for micro-reactors, whether it's um, federal sites that want to sign PPAs, um, that want to purchase the first electricity from these micro-reactors, um, or national labs, or um, even government buildings or hospitals um, could do this. Um, but it could also be we're seeing a lot of movement at the state level 
to bring in nuclear um, into into the market more. So whether you know changing renewable portfolio standards to clean energy standards, which a couple states have have toyed around with, and a lot of more states are considering, and that's something um, to kind of open up the market a little bit um, for for climate reasons. So uh, I don't think it's impossible. I don't think we're going to be um, we're stuck with the system we have. I think there's a lot of people thinking of new ways to do power markets uh, that's more fair um, and helps us get to low carbon faster. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Um, I don't think we're ever going to truly be able to compete head to head with uh, Rosatom, um, with Russia. Um, but if we do want to even have a chance of competing, there does have to be some level of government involvement. So. That's why we are in particular supportive of um, DOE supporting demonstrations, doing things like high assay, low enriched uranium, just because if there's not some level of support, it's very unclear um, that we're going to be able to compete when we're up against these larger behemoths. It's, it's hard to find exactly where that line is because I also would hate the idea of, of some kind of nationalized nuclear utility. Um, I'm glad that we moved away from that. Um, but I think we have to we have to find ways. What are the absolute key barriers that are preventing the nuclear energy industry from competing internationally? Try to take care of those because we do have a lot of vibrant people um, and vibrant companies that are working on really interesting and innovative solutions. And I think we can get back to that. And we need to try to use a scalpel um, rather than a hatchet. Yeah, and just can, to, yeah. to come back to NASA one more time. It was <laughs> it was very similar in that in the U.S. you had private companies competing with state-owned companies in Russia and China for, for launch services. And the U.S. really um, invested in the innovation infrastructure uh, to support private enterprises. And now we have SpaceX doing more commercial launches than Russia and China combined every year. Um, and that's, I think, one of the big strengths of the U.S. is the ability of our more nimble, more innovative private companies to really compete even with these state-owned enterprises. And I think that's what we'd like to see with nuclear as well. Um, while we don't have all of that support that Rosetta might have, we also probably have the ability to make nuclear products that are much more attractive to free markets. I would definitely echo that last point in that I'm glad we don't have the system that Russia has because we have a fuller array of innovation thanks to um, a dynamic nuclear market. I think the role of the government is definitely to allow access and to fix the regulatory system such that we have a more nimble um, pathway to uh, get these technologies up and running. So things like access to the labs. Um, I like the idea of uh, test privately funded, <laughs> I should say, test reactors on the labs. I think that's a, a great way to use the um, nimbleness of the free market and the ideas of private companies with the regulatory cover of the DOE. Um, where I start getting um, concerned is when we take the nuclear emission and apply it by force to something like the Department of uh, Defense, where we say, um, DOD, you must uh, sign a power purchase agreement with X technology. I don't care if it's nuclear or solar. Um, that's flipping a PPA on its head. Um, in the case of DOD, they need to be pursuing whatever technology, whatever energy source that's strategically advantageous to them. So that's how I see something like PPA. In um, NILA, I do like the idea of opening up PPAs so you don't have a floor or a cap on how long those last. So I think that's an area where I have some sympathy. Um, I guess there is there there is a price, there is a value at some point, some some premium to security supply for a DOD. Yeah, absolutely. I think there could be um, very sound strategic reasons that DOD would want a nuclear reactor. Um, I mean, that's why we have a nuclear navy. They clearly saw a strategic advantage, um, and that's been very successful. Uh, and then just one note on the NASA program. Um, I think one reason that has worked as well as it has is uh, it was combined with deregulation. Um, so it allowed uh, private sector innovation. And then clearly there was a um, defined 
uh, buyer in the situation that fit um, NASA's mission. Whereas Department of Energy, Department of Defense don't have that clear um, mission that I think constitutes a natural buyer. I think they do have a role in opening access. Any more questions out there? Yes. So the U.S. used to be the main supplier to the world of nuclear, and our export control um, system is still sort of grounded in that um, uh, case, which is not true anymore. So we're trying to stop technologies from getting out of the U.S., even though countries already have them. Uh, and it's very easy for them to get them um, in from a lot of different places. So um, we it's not about weakening export control. It's about modernizing. Uh, making them more risk informed, and um, there's a lot of different options there. Um, Nuclear Innovation Alliance put out a report on Part A10 reform that lays out a lot, of, and some of them have been worked into the the NILA, um, or is it are they in NICA? Uh, they're not in NILA or NICA. That was a separate bill from Bill Johnson. Oh, okay, that was Johnson. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. But that went through, and so there's been yes. there's been some some progress, and there's a lot of small things that don't don't have to go through um, changes in the economy. Energy Act, um, but definitely there are some maybe big changes in export control that would help. But even if you sort of I don't know got rid of export control or made it you know similar to um, to China or even France's um, system, we don't the U.S. companies don't have that um, state support for financing, which is really uh, where U.S. companies struggle with competing um, with Russia for these. Export control is one thing, but um, financing is the other big one. Other questions? Yes, Ted. Great, thanks. I, I uh, Ted Nordhaus, Breakthrough Institute. I'm also a co-author, um, so um, I have. Um, I will not ask questions of my other co-authors because I think I know what they think. Um, but I'm really, I questioned. I have. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a question um, each to uh, Matthew uh, and to Katie. Different questions, but I, I'm just interested in their perspective. Uh, so Matthew. Um, uh, obviously, I think uh, everyone here would agree that um, we would not want to soften regulatory oversight and licensing uh, or operations of micro reactors uh, such that we would uh, increase risk of accident, radioactive releases, uh, various other consequences uh, that could come with that. But I, 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 I'm, I'm interested, um, from your perspective, if um, you would uh, recognize that you know a five megawatt uh, reactor um, uh, might require significantly uh, different or even um, m many of the regulatory requirements that are quite applicable and reasonable for a one gigawatt uh, light water reactor might not be applicable for a five megawatt uh, reactor, whether with light water or something else. Um, and then Katie, uh, uh, my question to you, uh, recognizing your discomfort with requiring DOD or anyone, any other federal agency to enter into a power purchase and the agreement with any particular technology, um, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, you know, first of a kind micro reactors, like just about any other first of a kind reactor that's likely to, anyone's likely to build, uh, is probably that that first of a kind is going to be above market cost. Um, and so if one recognizes that, um, you know, there may be lots of good reasons why we would want to support an advanced nuclear industry that can be innovative and can compete uh, in free electricity markets and recognizing that the first of a kind is probably not going to be able to compete with a mature combined cycle gas plant or even a mature five megawatt wind turbine, um, uh, do you recognize that there might be some need for um, some policy or some mechanism to incentivize these developers to build those first of a kind uh, so we can figure out with learning and replication and multiples and all the things we know tend to make 
nuclear and other technologies cheaper, um, uh, whether there's a viable pathway to um, sort of competitive economic competitiveness. So my question is to both of our, our, our respondents and guests. I guess Matthew's being the gentleman. I'm, I'm going first. <laughs> um, yeah, there's absolutely a learning curve with new technology. I just uh, don't see that it's the taxpayer's role to subsidize that. Um, I kind of think uh, the folks in Georgia are feeling the same way right now. <laughs> and um, they're the ones that are covering you know, power plants that are doubling their costs. If they default on that, we're helping them out. Um, thanks to the DOE loan guarantees. So I recognize that there are learning curves, and I think that's one of the um, roles of the Department of Energy to make the labs accessible. Um, I think that's one of the beauties of microreactors is, as Jessica was saying at the very beginning, they're small and lower risk. So I think there's ways of getting at it. Um, there may be even communities that are interested in trying that first of a kind. But it, until someone can explain to me that uh, what you're recommending isn't a subsidy targeted at a unique um, industry, community, technology, I can't get on board with taxpayer dollars being spent that way. Uh, I just don't think it's a constitutional role of the government. And in the end, I'm, I'm not sure it's good for the technology you're trying to help because um, market forces competition i think ultimately drive you to a better product so i empathize you know first of a kind of anything is not easy um but i think that's how we get to better answers as soon as you start mixing politics into the equation you make something unreliable oftentimes more expensive um, and i think you're narrowing the focus of innovation so i, I hear you but i can't get on board with um, what i see as a subsidy program Yeah, if you can't convince a venture capitalist that X technology is worth the risk and worth the investment, um, I'm not sure why taxpayers should be the ones taking that risk. Now, I can see... Um, There's an indirect taxpayer involvement in DOD that has to do with proliferation. Right, so that's where I was headed. So if there is a um, legitimate government... Um, purpose that we're shooting for. For example, if Department of Defense sees this as a strategic advantage that they want to invest um, the risk and the money in, absolutely, that's an appropriate role. Um, the government is an appropriate uh, buyer in that situation. But I would need to know, what is the purpose of this? Is this to um, jumpstart a particular industry, or is this to meet a um, taxpayer appropriate function within the federal government. And then <clears throat> to, to respond to your question, okay, so, so one regulatory exercise that I'm very familiar with is called uh, SAMA, Severe Accident Mitigation Analysis. The NRC uses a computer program uh, called MAX to take different accident scenarios for a given reactor, plot whatever the source term is that comes out, the fallout plume, figure out how many people would be exposed even in, with an evacuation model, and then run that computer model every day of the year for typical weather patterns in the spring, summer, winter, fall, and then see what, what you get. What is, you know, what is the risk of different accident scenarios with different probabilities for a given population around the reactor? I would like to see that kind of analysis for a microreactor too. It's possible that risk scales with, with megawatt thermal. Uh, so if you have a 10 megawatt thermal reactor, it's you know one thirtieth the source term of a 3,000 megawatt thermal reactor. But I would still like to see that analysis. Well, we're going. Yeah, another question. John, I'm with the Defense Nuclear Facility Center. Uh, going back to the issue with export control and coming back to government tax being infused into this technology to help maybe don't start new technology. There are all kinds of what I call cultural roadblocks that exist in this country and how 
we relate to this particular industry that hasn't really been holistically looked at. So my question to you is, because the government started this industry, they did all the initial investment that basically jumpstart the flows of the commercial sector of this country. And because of that, the two are always linked in any way you want to look at it, from little piece of uranium that is mined from the mine all the way into what you do with the enrichment and how you control them. So this industry cannot completely severe itself away completely from political environment and from government infusion and government oversight. So it really complicates us trying to market. And one of the big roadblocks within this industry for this country as a whole relates to proliferation and how much energy we have around our proliferation activities. Government spend a whole lot of energy around and because of that export of any technology that potentially could be uh, looked at in terms of really promoting non-proliferation activities is, is also looked in the government point of view as something that they don't want anybody to do. So with this kind of a complexity, and how the economics of the nuclear industry is linked to the government. How do we come up with a model that in going forward, that really frees up a lot of the tangle, intangibles and tangibles that really hamper the cost associated with the industry so that we can all really get benefit. That's my question. It's a complicated question. <laughs> I, will, um, I will say one thing. I don't think nuclear is unique in being sort of um, entangled with the government from its beginning. Sure. I mean, the government was critical in developing a lot of our technologies, microchips, railroads, um, yeah, the internet, uh, and, and they don't have that same sort of, I don't know, uh, cultural mm -hmm. problem. Um, I do think there is a, a challenge in that nuclear power is still very much conflated with <coughs> nuclear weapons. I don't yeah. think it has to be. Um, I think just it's sort of a, I don't know, communication thing where you just keep them separate, you know, we can work on non-proliferation um, and have really strong roles on um, non-proliferation uh, and export control uh, that makes sense, and then we can also be promoting um, peaceful uses of nuclear energy, both in the U.S. and abroad, and I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would also add that in the global context around nuclear has changed so much that the idea of controlling exports does not lead to less proliferation if proliferation is your concern. And if, if, all, of the, if all of the reactors in the world could, be, could have all of their fuel supplied from US-based facilities, that would probably be a better situation for a lot of people who are concerned about proliferation. Um, so trying to find a way to you know, promote US culture around safety and security um, is a benefit from a proliferation <coughs> perspective, so we have to look at it in a new global context rather than thinking about it from the old Cold War era. Can I just jump on that? Um, that is one of the ways the U.S. historically has pushed much stronger um, uh, security and safety standards around the world is through our exporting our technology um, because we have better technology. So, for example, um, there's about probably a dozen countries across Africa that have um, nuclear cooperation agreements with China, with Russia, even with South Korea, very few with the U.S. And that's one where if we had kind of commercial nuclear products that um, those countries really wanted, we could have much more influence in helping them set up um, really strong regulations, um, safety, security, non-proliferation um, standards. And so that's a, I think that's an important aspect that the, the government should be concerned with is, is how do we kind of help exports for that reason. I can think of an example in the, the industry itself where there's a disassociation. We talked about nuclear and proliferation and the problem of its linkage, but we haven't talked about waste at all in this discussion. And waste, used to, nuclear waste, when I started working on the subject, was a very big issue. Yucca and all these things were all conflated together. And I mean, why aren't we talking about waste? I mean, uh, anybody want to answer that? I could talk about waste. <laughs> Say we should be talking about it. We should be talking about it. Yes. <laughs> it's not mentioned in the report, though. It is not mentioned in the yeah. report because because waste is um, is a separate issue in, in many ways. It's it's been it hasn't been solved, but it's not it's not uh, especially for micro reactors. It's not it's not the same issue. Yeah. 
I would, I would argue it is part of the issue um, because micro and advanced reactors have a compelling um, product when it comes to waste. So if we have, uh, I would argue, a more functional waste management system where, to be very brief, um, treating old waste as under the current system, but drawing a line in the sand and saying, okay, from here on forward, industry, you're responsible for waste management. Um, that's a huge selling point for then advanced reactors who have you know, very different waste streams or can even use waste. And all of a sudden, I think you've got a, a very economic, um, economically interesting equation. In addition to, at the end of the day, there still will be waste. And we absolutely need a solution to that. It's really hard to go to a, a PUC or an investor and say, oh, we've got a really cool technology, but by the way, we don't have a solution for waste. I mean, what a turnoff <laughs> for anyone who's interested in investing this, knowing you know the past 40 years and how contentious um, and expensive that has been on the industry. I would say, I mean, waste is one of those issues that seems like a natural place for the government to be in charge of the solution, but it doesn't have to be, and there could be much more distributed um, solutions, you know, regional um, temporary repositories, uh, and for example, in Sweden, which the government, the utility is very state supported, but um, waste is handled by the industry. Uh, you know, it has oversight and regulation, but they came up with a solution and they push it forward and it's, you know, they're making a lot of progress. So I think it's not out of the question that it would be a more handled by private. Yeah, um, uh, so uh, from my perspective as an environmentalist, nuclear waste, the is a profoundly important environmental issue, and it's an issue that affects future generations. We have 70, about 76,000 metric tons of nuclear waste stored at reactor sites. We have the, the, the nuclear waste from the, the Cold War production of nuclear weapons. Um, it has to be isolated from people in the environment over millennia, over, you know, so this is a, this is a tough, tough problem. Um, so that was one thing, and then the second thing I wanna say is, it's important uh, when you talk about advanced nuclear and its capabilities to consume nuclear waste or not produce nuclear waste, it's really important to see the performance of an as-yet-to-be-built prototype. And I guess an example would be the Transatomic Company um, in Boston. The original claims for the company um, were that it could uh, consume the nuclear waste of the Generation 2 reactors and produce energy 75 times more efficiently. And, and those claims were um, eventually refuted by Oak Ridge National Lab, and the company has just now shut its door. So it's a, it's a cautionary tale that without a lot of engineering, um, uh, pr proofreading, and, and, and eventually a prototype, the, the, the claims about the fuel cycle, the overall fuel cycle of advanced nuclear, they, they really need to be tested. So we're a bit over the hour, but we still have a little time. Any more questions out there? Compelling questions? Yes. Or so other ones? Can you talk about rural areas? Um, how, how far do these micro-reactors um, supply power for a rural area? Like in Arizona, there's the Domino Reservation, all these desert um, areas. Um, what kind of span do these rural reactors have in providing energy? I mean, like how many people can yes. they provide energy for? Yes. Um, that's a good question. I think we were saying you know, 10,000 people more or less, and um, some of the, the smallest ones, like a two megawatt, um, is about, can fit in about two shipping containers, yeah. so in terms of physical size. Yeah, yeah, that's right, I mean, it just depends on where your transmission and distribution is. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, somewhat unfair question to Katie, but so at the Heritage, you guys are very clever about subject. How, how do you reconcile stopping the next subject, it's not like there aren't any current, but the, by fair point, is any odd. So right, it's almost a philosophical question. She said stopping the next subsidy, or I, well, I'm not quite tracking yet. You made it very clear you're not too eager to subsidize anything. anything. Yet at the same time, <laughs> there's what do, you, what do you call them, tax breaks, credits, hand sandwiches, whatever. There, there's a lot already on the table. Yep. Absolutely, and I think, um, so a couple of weeks ago, um, my colleague Nick Loris and I came out with a paper on what do you do with coal and nuclear, um, especially considering what the Trump administration is trying to do. Uh, and basically, number one on that report and every report we've been writing for the last 
however many years is wind and solar tax credits need to be pulled off. Um, you know, if you want to help nuclear, have an, uh, a fair market. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I get tired of saying it maybe, but that's <laughs> absolutely what I mean by no future subsidies and do the politically hard thing, but um, the, I would argue the correct thing and get rid of subsidies that are already on the books. And I would say that also goes for um, natural gas, coal, oil. You know, at Heritage, we are fuel and technology neutral. Um, so when I say get rid of subsidies, I mean everybody. <laughs> I just wonder, maybe, just if each of you could say, you know, do you think that public opinion really matters at all in the development of new nuclear energy? Yeah. I think it very much matters, um, and I think. Can you kind of repeat the question? Or? Yeah. So, how much does public opinion matter uh, for the <coughs> And, um, but I, I think you know, you're right. People like smaller, better. I think they like advanced better, and it's not necessarily um, <coughs> rational. It's not. Oh, the risk is 100% less, so I like it 100% more. <coughs> I think it's more just that um, new nuclear doesn't have a lot of that baggage um, that historic nuclear does. And whether it's fair that people have you know, bad associations with um, the older nuclear plants, you know, not for me to decide, but it does, it seems like a break um, in the technology and <coughs> something very different. I think for a lot of people, it's sort of a restart. Particularly when you start looking at these extremely small plants. Like when I s tell someone two megawatts, they're like, that's how <coughs> a wind turbine is. And that's very different um, for people and how they think about it. And when you talk about something being able to be, say, um, at a university powering the whole university or at a hospital powering the hospital, um, that just feels much more just like your friendly neighborhood nuclear plant. So I think, yeah, definitely can ha could have, not as, it's not implicit that people will like it, but um, could have. Each of you have, I'm sorry. You oh, oh, yeah, I was just, I was going to add that um, I think it does really matter, and also we want it to matter. We don't want a situation where people are, like, being forced to have these things. We want people to like them. If people like them, then you have better capital. You have more people who actually want to build these. I mean, we can look at coal. Um, I mean, you know, impending regulations on coal have dropped off in the new administration. There aren't a bunch of new coal builds going on right now across the country. Public opinion is very anti-cold generally on a on a on a large scale, um, and if we don't get to better public opinion somehow on nuclear, there's not going to be very large scale build. There might be a few builds at least initially, but you're not going to have it make a very large part of um, of the generation mix in any country unless there's some amount of public will. Questions? I just want to make one comment when we talk about waste, and I want to see your reaction. There's nothing like there's no solution to the nuclear waste. It's a, it's a policy decision. We can, we can build Yaka Mountain today if the government is willing to do it. And so I want us to change the, the language associated with nuclear waste. It's a matter of policy. Anybody just like the uh, Sweden has done it, or any other country can build a repository. The technology is a, a matter of country's policy and detecting what they want to do. Just a comment, and if you are, any other feedback? Yeah, it definitely is a, a policy um, <laughs> issue. Uh, I think an interesting example is Finland, I believe, where, again, the industry is responsible. Uh, a couple decades ago, they went to communities where they thought um, a good facility could be built, geologically speaking, and the uh, community that they landed on was almost unanimously against facility. Uh, but I think because it was a business talking with the community rather than a federal government talking with the community, over the course of at least 10 years, a lot of conversations, a lot of education, um, a lot of negotiating about you know, what a mutually beneficial arrangement would look like for the community, um, 
they recently are moving forward with plans to build the facility. Um, so I think, and, and in that case, the community almost did a complete 180 where it's unanimous or very close to unanimous in bringing the facility in. So I think that's where you get movement in nuclear waste is when you have an equal playing field. And an equal playing field doesn't look like you know the federal government coming in and saying you must. Um, it happens when you have the industry being asked to come in and build something and then figuring out something mutually beneficial. Um, so I think that's one area where we, need, where we need to improve our own policy. I could talk for an hour on nuclear waste if you want to do that, or you know, no, it's do okay. it offline, but I think that's a start. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> um, does each of you have a favorite uh, advanced nuclear reactor design? Anybody have? There are roughly 75 out there. I know it's a... Let's say we're fuel and technology neutral, so there's no <laughs> the answer to that. I would like ones that are uh, economically competitive. That's that's my favorite. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I, I like reading annals of nuclear energy, <laughs> but I don't have a favorite reactor. <laughs> okay, let's uh, do some odds making now. <coughs> Westinghouse just made the cut, the final cut to, for the final four for the Saudis' uh, nuclear program. What are the odds that the U.S. wins out over what is it, China, Russia, and South Korea? Is that right? What do you What do you think? Because that's a it's a it's obviously an issue because whoever makes that decision, um, whatever company and country is involved, has a relationship with Saudi Arabia and nuclear nuclear power for a hundred years, as you said. Who was eliminated? I think the last four are South Korea, Russia, China, and the United States. I, Mike, I could be I could be wrong. So France is out. Well, yeah, it was there was some perplexing reporting today ah. as to what the clear. journals listed them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Wall Street Journal listed four, and up until now there was a, a long list of five, and then they shortlisted it to five, and then <laughs> and then today it's listed as four. And honestly, as of an hour and a half ago, we okay, maybe we can poll the audience then. I mean, what do you think the odds are? Because it's a, I mean, it's really Our quite poor. I mean, what do you think the odds are? I guess any I would know. Of the U.S. being picked. Well, it's only Western. Correct. Yeah. Less than ten percent. I would say it's zero if we don't get a one-two-three agreement. Yeah. <laughs> so. Zero, ten percent. So I think I'm not. I'm not going to put a number on it. <laughs> um, I would like to be higher. I think there's an interesting conversation to be had with maybe a U.S. South Korea um, mm -hmm. engagement there because the U.S. has a long history uh, with Saudi Arabia in many categories, not just nuclear. Um, the South Koreans have shown that they can build reactors on time and on budget. Um, the US has a long history with um, the nuclear industry and we're considered the gold standard for operation. So, you know, I think that's an interesting one, two punch, but I'm not gonna put an odd on it. And okay. uh, we still need a one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, I would like it to be much higher. If we get the one, two, three and we get XM back up and running, um, then there's a, there's a good chance. Yeah, I know, we need both of those though. And we team with South Korea. Yeah. Jessica? Uh, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica? Um, I Well, I knew we'd go over an hour. That's why I decided to have an hour and a half to talk about this. But we're wrapping up 